Hey, Grace Church, great to be with you. Um, thought I'd start out with a little uh, eclipse humor. What did the scientists conclude when they found bones on the moon? Uh, cow didn't make it. There you go, you can, you can use it this week. Happy Solar Eclipse Eve. Uh, if you miss this one, you're, you're gonna have to wait till 2444 to see it again in this area. It's pretty crazy. Uh, it's great to be with you. I, I hope you had a great Easter celebration last Sunday. Uh, glad you're back this week. Uh, I do wanna make something clear uh, this morning. Last week I was greeting at the, the main entrance with Pastor Ethan and here's what I noticed. Um, you can see the picture here. Uh, we, were, we were greeting together and um, just about everybody who came in saw Ethan in his jacket, his fancy jacket there. Uh, complimented him on how nice he looked. I was standing right there. And so uh, it's fine, except I, I, you know, I was standing there and, and not once did anyone say, Jonathan, you look nice this morning. In fact, I had to start fishing for compliments uh, just to keep up with the young guy. I may, I may need the dust off my suit coat. Uh, nothing as fancy as that though, I'm telling you. Now, I was kidding with Ethan and uh, the truth is most of us like to be noticed. But when being noticed becomes a priority, when it becomes an obsession, when it becomes a necessity, Jesus has some words to say today. And so this morning we're continuing our, our series in one of the most famous sermons in history, given none other than by Jesus. He spends three chapters in Matthew's gospel preaching to the crowds and about what life looks like for citizens of the kingdom of God. And historically and practically, there have been several ways people approach Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Some try to live out these commands and, and truth by simply gritting it out. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not enjoying this, but I'm going to do it. On the other hand, others hear Jesus' words and think to themselves, ah, that's, that's too much to ask, uh, too hard for me. And they simply just give up. But what Jesus is asking isn't something we should try to manufacture in our own strength. We follow Jesus and his teachings by humbly repenting, turning again and again and again to Jesus, and by abiding with Jesus, living our lives, listening, depending on who he is, what he's done, what he's taught. The verses uh, that we'll be looking at on the screen uh, will be on the screen, but if you want to follow along, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we start a new section of the sermon in, in Matthew chapter 6 as Jesus continues his teaching on true righteousness. Uh, first, we need to, first, we need to look at what is true righteousness. In the Bible, righteousness is contrasted with wickedness and, and self-centeredness, which which neither reveres God nor respects others. Uh, a righteous person is described as just or right, as someone who prioritizes God's truth, prioritizes God's heart, that, that trusts God. The problem is we can't attain this righteousness on our own because God is holy, holy, holy. His, his standard is too high. But the good news is that God in his mercy has made righteousness possible for us through Jesus. Through Christ Jesus, we possess the righteousness of Christ as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, Jesus Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. That being said, Jesus continues his teaching on what this righteousness looks like practically, what, what it looks like lived out in everyday life. And so chapter 6, verse 1 begins this way, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others, truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your, your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 
Well, first of all, notice he begins with a warning. He says, be careful. Or it could be better translated, beware. Uh, Jesus has explained the deeper meaning of the law. He's called his disciples to a greater righteousness. Let's us know that, that we're entering dangerous waters here. There's a, there's a real danger of taking these beautiful acts of righteousness and emptying them of all their meaning by making them about us, by making them about ourselves. And so he warns us, he says, be careful, watch out, beware. You're going to need to watch your heart. What's the issue here? It's your motivation, your heart. It all comes down to who gets the praise. Do you get the praise or does God get the praise? So Jesus takes this principle and applies it specifically in the area of giving and later on with praying and fasting, which is interesting because these were three important duties and almost are three important duties in almost every religion in the world, but they were of particular importance to ancient Judaism. They were sometimes called the three pillars of Judaism. That's why Jesus doesn't say, if you give, if you pray, if you fast, but he says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. It's already assumed that we're doing these things. It's assumed that we're already givers. So the first thing I want to point out is we are to be genuine givers. I mean, it makes sense. A follower of Jesus will be generous because Jesus has been generous giving his life for us. A follower of Jesus will be compassionate because Jesus demonstrated mercy and grace in the most unfathomable way. We give, we love, we serve because he first loved us. He gave sacrificially. He served us by giving us spiritual life. Now, we're a pretty competitive family. We enjoy games, but when my son Micah was younger, while we were playing a game, sometimes he'd, he'd stop the game and he'd say something like, my name is Giver. And he'd, he'd just start giving away his cards, his money, his resources to everyone in the game, which is really annoying when you're competitive and trying to win and he's giving other players things that, that, that will keep you from winning. Well, at, that, at some point he began to realize, well, being Giver isn't helpful to me winning. Uh, so this was the next stage. Sometime there, during the game, he'd start what he called a, a bro alliance, in which he'd share resources and money with his brothers, but not his parents. Even, even more annoying. Um, but then the competitive, competitiveness kicked in, and he went through a third stage in which he would hide and hoard resources until the very end of the game. And then when everyone was counting up points, he'd be pulling out cards and resources and money that no one knew he had. Well, here's the point. He went from giver to give only the people I choose to hoarder. And as I think about this, I think our lives can sometimes take the same kind of course. We're generous because we want to help others. We've been given much, so we want to give. We want to be generous. But sometime along the way, we've, we've, we've gotten burnt by this. And so we become a little bit more leery. We become a little bit more, uh, less objective and more selective in our giving. And eventually this can lead to only selecting ourselves because man, I need to take care of myself, my own needs. I've worked hard for this. I, I can't trust anyone, so I'm just gonna keep everything for myself. Which is one thing when you're playing a game a completely different thing when it comes to how you do life. And Jesus expects, expects us to give. Giving is a part of our DNA as followers of Jesus. Jesus gave his life so I can have life. If I want to reflect Jesus, one of the best ways to do that is to give of myself, my resources, my time, my seat, in order to prefer someone else. A great example of this happened last week. We asked uh, many of our regular attenders to, to move services to make room for our guests, and you did, and it was great. Uh, if, if you were able to move to a different service last week to open up space and prefer others, thank you. I mean, that's the perfect example of this. Now realize, I, I don't say this about giving to guilt us into giving. 
It's simply a fact of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. We're givers. If I'm a follower of Jesus, I should be looking for ways to help others without drawing attention to myself. Looking for ways to love people in a way that shines the lights bright on Jesus. But you might be thinking, okay, well that's great, but Jesus said earlier that, that we're salt and light and, and we're to let others know about our good deeds so they glorify God. But in this passage we just read, Jesus seems to be saying the opposite. He's saying when you give, beware that you don't toot your horn to be noticed by others. So what, what's Jesus talking about? He's addressing doing good things for the wrong reasons. Jesus is addressing two different issues. In Matthew 5, he's, he's addressing our influence with the world as salt and light, that we need to be different from the world. But here in Matthew 6, he's addressing the motivation of our heart. Why do we do what we do? What's our motive? To give God glory to, or to gain glory for ourselves. You see, it's not only important that you follow Jesus and reflect his love and priorities to others, but that we do these things for the right reason. Jesus says, beware of self-promotion that's hypocritical. Acting like you're doing a good thing while you're being motivated by personal fame and self-centeredness. He says, beware of giving to, to, giving to promote yourself rather than the Lord. I think A.B. Bruce sums this up well when he says, we're to be slow when tempted to hide and hide when tempted to show. Our good works must be public so that our light shines. Our relig religious actions must be secret lest we boast about them. The end of, <clears throat> end of both instructions of Jesus is the same, namely the glory of God. Why are we to keep these things secret? It's in order that the glory may be given to God rather than men. Why are we to let our light shine and do good works in the open? It's that men may glorify our Heavenly Father. As I was thinking about that <clears throat> recently, and I was thinking about those who serve the public, people like doctors and nurses and paramedics and police officers and firemen, and it's part of their job, it's part of their training to take care of people. And it often extends beyond their job and into everyday life. I was thinking about this recently because a couple of weekends ago, my brothers and, my, and our boys went backpacking up in Spruce Knob, West Virginia. And uh, it was interesting. The weather was supposed to be clear. It was supposed to warm up. It didn't. Uh, we hiked in fog, and when the freeze came, it got down to 12 degrees that night. And everything froze. Ice on our tents. Uh, just frost inside the tents. And so the next morning, we're getting out of our tents. We're, we're trying to figure out, do we want to spend another sleepless night in the freezing cold? When we hear Micah say, guys, this is bad. Well, we weren't sure what he was talking about until he came out of the woods and blood is dripping from his hand. He, he'd slipped on some icy ground and sliced his palm, which made our decision for us. We need to go. So we gathered up all our stuff. We started to hike back up the mountain to our cars and we got to the parking lot and I saw a woman there with her, her kids ready to take a bike ride. And, and I just went up to her and said, hey, are, are you from around here? Um, we have an emergency. We need to get them to an emergency room or urgent care or something like that. And she said, well, I'm not from around here, but I'm a doctor. <laughs> And so she came over and unbandaged his hand and she checked for ligament damage and gave us some advice about, you know, um, what to do until we could get help. No sooner had she finished, this group of young guys comes uh, hiking out of the woods and, uh, and, and asks, hey, what's, what's going on over here? Well, we found out they were from Youngstown and four of them were paramedics. And so we had a doctor and four paramedics in this one little parking lot in Spruce Knob, West Virginia. And they happened to have kits in the back of their cars. Well, they, they again, they, they undid the, the bandages, they cleaned the wound a little better, they, they wrapped it up, gave him some ice to slow the bleeding till we could get to the hospital. And not, not only was it God's grace that a doctor and four paramedics happened to be in the same parking lot when we got there, 
as I thought about this message today and how they responded and how they reacted, they never flinched. It was their second nature to jump in and to help. They didn't act inconvenienced. They went right to work, taking care of his hand. They didn't ask for anything. We never even got to know their names. They were just glad to help. It's what they were trained for, to jump into an emergency and to help. By the way, it turned out he, he severed a, a nerve in his palm and, and had, uh, had surgery on Good Friday to get it reattached. He's doing fine. Um, looks like he's got plenty of great snacks there. Um, but he'll have to do some rehab. It was definitely a memorable trip. But here's, here's what I wonder. I wonder if as followers of Jesus, we were trained and equipped internally with an instinct for compassion and generosity motivated by the good news of Jesus in our lives. What would that look like? If our reflex was compassion, our reflex was to give. Now I realize a part of a doctor and paramedic's job is to care for people. But I also think it's our responsibility as followers of Jesus, wanting to reflect Jesus, that we exercise compassion and generosity as a regular and not unusual part of our lives. Every time we give, we have an opportunity to point people to God, to, to shine the lights bright on Jesus. In fact, I think, uh, <clears throat> I think all of chapter 6 can be summed up in two words, and that is God first. I mean, why do you do good things? God first. What's your motivation? God first. You see, there's a right way to give and a wrong way to give. It's either God first or me first. It's a matter of what motivates me. And Jesus is going to the heart and the motivation of what we do. And so verse 2, it says, So when we give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. There's a right and a wrong way to give. The wrong way is to draw attention to your own righteousness in a way that, that puts you on center stage. Hey guys, look what I'm doing. I like how Eugene Peterson paraphrases what Jesus says here when he says, we especially, be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. See, we were never meant to take center stage. The wrong way is to draw attention to what you're doing. When, when, when you do it that way, Jesus says, you've already received your reward. You've been recognized. A couple months ago, I was part of a, our team that went to Mexico to serve alongside our partner church down there. And by the way, thank you for praying. Um, there's so many things that could have went sideways, but it was an amazing trip filled with incredible people and, and opportunities, I believe, that were orchestrated by God because of your prayers. So thank you for praying. I'd never been to Mexico, and one of the many things I found fascinating were the bands on the beach that, that played loudly and proudly. In fact, we, we stayed at a building a couple blocks off of the beach, and we were on this rooftop, and you could just hear them playing all throughout the day. Uh, it's not every day you, you see someone lugging a tuba, a trumpet, a drum, cymbals, and a large speaker down the beach. Uh, you couldn't help but notice them. They, they were loud. Uh, several times I was in a conversation and they were behind me and they started playing. It scared me half to death. Uh, everything they did was to get attention. To get attention so they could get paid for their performance. Well, one of the last days I was talking to one of the staff leaders, uh, his name's Eduardo, and I asked him, if I said, hey, do you like this music? And he said, no, <laughs> it's not music, it's just noise. And I laughed. I said, well, well what do you mean by that? And he said, they just make noise. Well, I pointed out that the guy was, he had a microphone, he was singing. I, and I said, you know, he's singing something. He says, no. He goes, it's just gibberish. He's, he's not singing words. It, it's just noise for the tourists. <laughs> In other words, everything they were doing was to get attention and money. And see, when Jesus says they announce themselves with trump trumpets, Jesus is pointing out the, the ridiculousness of their hypocrisy. It's literally just theater. 
Because interesting, the, the word, verse 1, to be seen by men is from a, a Greek word, uh, theomai. It, it's where we, we get our, our word for theater. It means to gaze at, to study, to command attention so that people look at you. You're doing something to be noticed. You're taking center stage and making sure the spotlight is on you. So today, so, so today we understand what Jesus is saying is, don't be theatrical. Don't put on a show. Don't pretend to be something that you're not. When you do, you miss God's reward because you've already received your reward. You got what you wanted, attention. What's the issue? It's not that you gave and, and someone saw you. It's not that you served and, and your picture ended up in the paper. No, it's about motivation, your heart. Who gets the praise? When you give, remember God first. Since this is largely a hard issue, I, I want to take some time to, to talk about what some have called approval addiction. See, approval addiction is to be held captive by what you think other people may think about you. It's the disease to please. Pastor and author John Ortberg demonstrates this by saying, I, I know I'm supposed to be humble, but what if no one notices? <laughs> Another pastor calls it uh, AGD, uh, attention getting disorder. People in Jesus' day liked to improve their status by displaying how devoted to God they were. Jesus is describing his audience as people who give, pray, and fast because they want to impress others. They want to be seen, all the while pretending to, to do it because they love God so much. But in, instead, it was theater without substance. Honestly, I, I think it's something we all struggle with at different times in our lives. Pretending, doing, saying, or <clears throat> saying or not saying things so others will approve of us. It can be so subtle, it's, it's scary to think about. For example, you may be suffering from approval addiction if you find yourself getting hurt by what other people say about you. When people express other than glowing opinions about you, you probably have approval addiction. If you habitually compare yourself with others, if you find yourself getting competitive in just ordinary situations, you probably have it. If on Easter the young guy in the suit coat gets more attention than you and you feel like bringing it up in a sermon, you probably have it. <laughs> if you live with a nagging sense that, that you're not important enough or special enough, or you get envious of another person's success, you probably have it. If when others are getting praised and complimented, you wish it was you. Or maybe you feel unrecognized, you, you probably have it. If you have trouble saying no, even to something you don't really want to do because you're afraid somebody's going to get upset with you, you probably have approval addiction. <clears throat> if you find yourself apologizing all the time for fear of offending somebody when you've done nothing wrong, you probably have it. If you tend to disclose only things about yourself that you feel will be viewed positively, or, or maybe you hide or minimize things about you that you fear others may disapprove or judge negatively, you probably have it. If you freeze up or feel anxious when someone asks, you, asks your opinion because you don't want to risk saying something wrong, you probably have it. If the number of likes and comments you get or don't get on social media makes you either very sad or excessively happy, you probably have it. If you are at this moment starting to worry that someone might be thinking that you're an approval addict, you probably are. And see, there you go. We just went from the theoretical to stepping on toes. And I know, my toes are bruised too. <laughs> I think author and theologian Henry Nouwen puts this problem in perspective when he wrote, at issue, here's the question, to whom do I belong? To God or to the world? Many of my daily preoccupations suggest that I belong more to the world than to God. A little criticism makes me angry and a little rejection makes me depressed. A little praise raises my spirits and a little success excites me. Often I'm like a small boat on the ocean, completely at the mercy of its waves. 
Now, don't answer out loud, but can anyone relate to this? So if we're not to take center stage, how do we give in a way that shines the light bright on Jesus? Verse 3 says, But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. You see, we must not be more concerned with what the hand is doing than what the heart is thinking. The wrong way to give is to be honored by men, taking center stage, doing it for applause. But what's the right way to give? Jesus says, in secret. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. But how is that possible? What, what could he mean? I think Jesus is saying when you give, don't dwell on it. Don't give out of a motivation of, of self-satisfaction. There should be no patting yourself on the back with your left hand while, while giving with the right. I want you to understand the question is not so much what the hand is doing, but what the heart is thinking. See, there's three possibilities when we give. Number one, we're, we're seeking the praise of men. Number two, we preserve the anonymity but are quietly congratulating ourselves. Or three, we desire the approval of God alone. But when you give in secret, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He sees your generosity even if no one else does. He also knows your motives. Whether you're trying to make a name for yourself or earn your way to God or simply give or simply give as been, has been given to you. He sees it. But I think, I think we need to be careful here because this can quickly become legalistic. You know, we can go to such great lengths to make sure that no one knows that we give to help others. That we, we put all these rules on ourselves. But it's not about giving so no one sees us as much as it's about giving with the right motivation that God is glorified and not ourselves. So how do we go about practicing this kind of secret service? Well, I need to shrink the, opinion, the opinions of others in my life while at the same time amplifying who Christ says I am. Enjoy the story of this boxer. Um, he moved uh, to Chicago, and, and this is how he described his arrival. He said, I got off the bus with two cardboard suitcases under my arms in downtown Chicago, stopped in front of the Sears Tower. I put my suitcases down, and I looked up at the tower, and I said to myself, I'm going to conquer Chicago. And when I looked down, my suitcases were gone. <laughs> you see, when, we f when our focus becomes self-centered, pride begins to blind us. Blind us to what's most important as well as the needs around us and, and even in us. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives favor, shows favor to the humble. If you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. If you, if you have to announce your greatness to people, you may not be so great. <laughs> Instead, let God change the aim of your life. Colossians 3 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. See, so too often our, our sights are set on the wrong things, building our own reputation and identity on things that, that give us temporary approval from others, that sometimes cater to our pride, our approval addiction, but they never satisfy. Andrew Murray says that the truth is this, pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. In other words, it's less of me, it's to be more of Jesus. I think we see some very practical examples of this in the life of Paul. Paul in his letter to the church in Corinth says, he says, I care very little. I want you to, to hear that. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Now, Paul's addressing, among many other things, the fact that a bunch of people had come into the church and were saying negative things about him, were judging him, challenging his leadership, challenging his authority. How, how does he respond? He says, I care very little. 
He considers it a small thing that he's being judged by others. He's not looking for their approval. Now, Paul didn't say it, it meant nothing. Uh, what other people thought still mattered, but he, he just didn't let it matter too much. In other words, negative opinions and criticism could no longer rock his boat. Why? Because both his balance and his sense of well-being rested in his acceptance from Christ Jesus. Jesus has authority in his life. Jesus is his priority. God's opinion is, is the one that matters most. And Paul says, it's the Lord who judges me. He's my primary audience. I don't have to toot my own horn. I've received my reward from him. Now, now imagine receiving criticism or judgment is a very small thing. Imagine being set free from the need to impress anyone. Imagine your sense of, of worth no longer resting on whether someone notices how smart or attractive or generous or, or religious you are. As, as approval addicts, we're, we're always at the mercy of others' opinions. But in, in another letter, Paul writes, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. You think about who's he, whose approval was he seeking? Who's he living the please? Who was Paul's audience? But we know that not everyone lived the same way. We have, I think it's a chilling account from Jesus' life. In John 12, it says, Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in Jesus. But, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. And then get this, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. That's exactly what, exactly what Jesus is addressing here in Matthew 6. They were more concerned about the approval of others than resting in the approval of God. And the only way we can combat this is to stop trying to build our own identity and instead rest in the identity that we have in Christ to find our security and significance in God's love and in our identity and, and what he says about us. And when we start to live in and from the gospel, a lot of the things that used to matter to us start to fade away in insignificance. When you begin to live for an audience of one, the one that matters most, you begin to experience the freedom of what it means to be in Christ. You realize you no longer have to earn approval. You, you can find freedom from approval addiction. I mean, I think that's one of the greatest rewards. Our reward is a life of freedom in Christ. It's freedom from trying to earn our salvation, a freedom from putting on appearances, a freedom from the exhausting pursuit of others' approval, freedom from the tyranny of approval addiction, a freedom to give fast and pray without the weight of others' judgments and opinions. It's a freedom to live the life Jesus has given us. We often live as prisoners of others' approval. We're held captive by their opinions. But we need to realize our salvation was never in our hands or their hands or anyone else's hands. Self-centeredness never gives birth to life. Only Jesus gives life. Now understanding choosing to live our lives for an audience of one keeps us from, from gritting it out or giving up. And instead, it, it leads us to be more aware of God's presence in our lives. The more we develop this intimacy with God abiding in Jesus, the less we'll strive for the affirmation and attention and approval and approval of others. The less uh, those things will matter. And through this, we discover a secret that I think still eludes many people. Our lives do matter. Not because someone noticed us or liked our posts or saw us being generous but because God is always with us, with us, noticing every moment of our lives. Be careful not to perform your righteous acts before men to be seen by them, but give without regard to anyone else's, <clears throat> give without regard to anyone else's approval. Give, pray fast with an audience of one, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When we begin to amplify God's truth about us, 
begin to realize the beauty of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Our, our reward is the music of God speaking over us and for us and within us. It's learning to live out whose we are and not our hypocritical performance. It's, it's learning to dance to the music of who God says we are. As we close, I'd like to I'd like you to just put down whatever you're holding right now. Close your eyes. Just no distractions. Um, I want to I want to share a small portion of what God says about you today. Because I think if we were to truly grasp, if we were truly grasp what God says about us, our approval addiction could be overcome, and these truths might transform in us a reflex to serve to give like Jesus. God has a lot to say about what he thinks about you this morning and today. But if we could just summarize for a brief moment, this is what you would hear God say from his word. While you were still sinners, Christ died for you. While you were still hostile toward me, you were reconciled to me by the death of your son. Sin doesn't have the last word, grace does. Now everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I have adopted you. You are children of God, heirs of God. You're no longer orphans. You belong to me. There is now no condemnation for you. All your sins are forgiven. All your sin has been forgiven. You are now righteous in my sight with the very righteousness of my perfect son. You've been saved by grace. You are utterly secure in me. Nothing will be able to separate you from my love in Christ Jesus. No one is to snatch you out of my hand, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. You are now part of the people of God, and together the life you now live is, in, is by faith in my Son. Stay close to Jesus. Abide in him, for your life is found in him. Don't live by your own power or understanding. No, live by my Spirit within you. Remember, I have given you the Holy Spirit to be with you and in you. The Spirit will guide you into all truth, help you to obey me, and empower you to do my work. Therefore, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. You are no longer darkness, but salt and light, and my son, walk as children of light. I have called you. I have chosen you. Through Jesus, you are victorious. You have a glorious future. You are a citizen of heaven. You are an ambassador for my son. And I love you as a perfect father. Father, I thank you. Thank you for these truths. Lord, help us to understand and live it, live in the, in the light of these truths. Lord, help us to, to know your love so that, so that our instinct is to love and to give without recognition. Lord, that the posture of our heart is humility. That our posture of our heart is a reflection of your heart. Lord, align our hearts with yours. Lord, we love you too, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, next week we'll continue in chapter 6. I hope you'll join us. Take care. It's been great being with you.